Hello, it's Ryan Gordon. Um, for part seven, I thought I might do something slightly different um, because it's occurred to me there's something fairly important I have not explained. But before we do that, we have to fix a few bugs. Um, so, uh, as Jan pointed out, I made a rookie mistake here, which always happens when you uh, change things and don't go all the way through it. Um, this is our little block of code where we feed more audio to the device if it needs it. And I forgot to change something. Remember, we added num converted bytes. Um, but then I came through here and we did all our work with that. We changed the volume, we changed the balance of the thing, and then we feed the original number of bytes, which was wrong. We should have been converted bytes to the audio device. So that was a stupid mistake, happens all the time. Um, programming in general is just an ongoing course correction against human error, so um, this is a good example of that. This will not be the last mistake I make like this. Um, so I'm pointing this out. This should never happen, so we're just going to do this with an assert up here. Uh, but just in case, for some reason, you don't get a full sample frame back from SDL audio stream get, but you always should, at least in theory. Um, we'll just check for that like this. So if assert that num samples mod 2 equals 0, which is to say that if it's an even number of samples, which is to say it's a stereo set of samples, sample frames, then we should be okay. This should always be stereo data at least for now. If we change that, we'll probably fire that, trigger that assert, and that'll be good to have that there so we know. Um, okay, let's see. The other thing someone pointed out to me is that our slider balance is not necessarily incorrect except for the basic problem that when it's dead center and the balance slider is about at halfway there, it's at 0 0.5 ish, then you're just having all these samples. They're going to run at half the volume. So that's obviously not right. Let's fix that real quick. Um, and we're going to do it like this because you could just simply come in here and do an if, if we're on the left. On the, come on, dude. On the left. Then do this one, otherwise do this. But you don't want to, you know, old school programming, game programming practices taught me you should want to try and bubble conditionals out of for loops. It's better to do multiple for loops with the conditional outside of it rather than do, check that unchanging if every time in the middle. I don't know, maybe compilers are smart enough to catch that now and bubble it out for you, but for clarity, we're going to do it. So if the value slider is on the left, And we will say, well, okay, if it's, let's say if it's greater than five, the, greater than halfway, then we want to do the one on the left. Because if it's, it's if the slider is more on the right, then we want to make the left one get quieter. Good. Else if the balance slider is on the left, then we want to do the same thing but only mess with the right-hand sample all the way through it. Um, and then if it's dead center, we don't adjust it at all because you'd just be setting the samples exactly where they should be. So these will only change, this is basically just reduce the gain, the volume of the left or right, whichever way the slider is not facing. Um, I feel like we should test that real quick, well, just to make sure I did not screw that up. I did not bother to set this up to uh, record the audio right from the machine, so that was foolish of me, but here comes everyone's favorite song. All right, it's still doing left and right. You're just gonna take my word for it for now that that is definitely where we want it to be. Okay, so we fixed that bug, that bug, that bug. Okay, that's all the bug fixing we're doing today. We're at four minutes, I'm already I wanted to make this five minutes or less, but we did this first. So I feel like that was good. We did that. We're not doing anything else with the program today because it occurred to me that I never explained what this actually is. So if you've never actually thought about this before, I'm just going to explain it really quickly the way I understand it, which I didn't even read Wikipedia. This is just me stumbling through this for years. So if something sounds wrong, it probably was. Um, let us look at... Uh, Music.wave, the thing I was just playing there a second ago. This is what it looks like as a waveform. Now, if you want, if you were to see that play, let's turn the volume up a little bit. Right, there's our little. That's where it is right now. 
All right, you've heard this before. Now you can see from this waveform that there are louder parts, like here's some drum beats by themselves. Let's play just that. Hear them? Just those waveforms are louder, so just the, those drums are louder, so the waveform gets bigger. Now this just looks like a solid blob of crud right now, so let's focus in on just one of these real quick. And I'm gonna hit the magic zoom button right here, and we're gonna get closer in on it. See the white parts what I had highlighted there? Keep going. See how it's starting to look more like, well, a sound wave. So, and you can see if this is just that one drum beat, it's not much by itself, I know, but come here. There we go. So let's go focus just in on this big part here. And as you zoom in further and further, you will start to see, you can see how it goes up and down like that. But as you zoom up, oh, there it is. Each of these is one single value of samples uh, and you can see these go from one to negative one and all this is is a digital representation of a sound wave um, if when you push these through the audio hardware eventually they send an electric current something to that extent to uh, your speakers and your speakers have a little piece of cardboard in them that vibrates as it plays this thing at a certain intensity. And as that cardboard or whatever goes back and forth, this goes up and down. And you can see point by point the values that we're feeding to it. Now we're feeding these values to it very, very fast. This thing is playing at 22,050 hertz, which is to say that there are these little dots here. There are 22,050 of them every second. And this is a fairly low resolution file. Um, I want to say, let's look at, you know, uh, Kevin Hartnell's thing here, the podcast thing, podcast thing we're doing. This is much denser because it's a much longer thing, but when you zoom in, it'll start looking more like that again. So let's just take, well, I don't know, here, just play just a second of this. So, so that's that podcast thing we are listening to before. First off, you'll see there's two of these here because, uh, well, let me zoom in. You can see a little clearer here. Let me just pick this little piece. How's it? Okay, sure. Zoom in on this. It'll start to look more like a waveform as we get in there. There we go. And there's my dots. Those are your values. This is playing at 44,100 uh, 44, hertz. 44,100 floating point samples per second uh, to make that sound wave. Um, but as you can see, there's two. So, And this is what we are converting everything to. So you would have up here is your left channel, down here is your right channel, and th that would be sample zero, and this would be sample one, and then the next one would be up here, then the next floating point down here, back and forth, ping-ponging back and forth as it feeds it to the device. That's called interleaved audio data. Some audio libraries, but not many of them, want them to be separate, so you send them a big block of data that's all the left channel and a big block of data that's all the right channel, but most things don't work that way. Um, let's see here. So that's more or less how this works. That's more or less once we load the wave file, or eventually once we load MP3s and stuff like that. I meant sooner or later, MP3s are compressed audio and they chop some bits out so that they can be a smaller file. But eventually, sooner or later, after they calculate them and process them and prepare to hand them to the sound card, eventually they're just these dots. They become you know, floating point values. Now, since we're dealing with floating point in the program, and that's also what this program, Audacity, is, uh, the sound editor is showing you too, um, you can see the range that it generally goes from is negative one to one as this goes. But this is not the only way to represent, represent audio. Like that first wave file, when it's not converted by Audacity, is also compressed stuff, but um, so I can't show you there. But it's uh, generally expected to be 16-bit integers, and it goes from negative 32,760 whatever to positive 32,767. I always get that last number wrong. I'm sorry if I got it wrong there. Um, and you can have very, very old wave files or PCM data, which means pulse code modulation um, that is you can have very old stuff, which is 0 to 255, and just the low end is 0, the high end is that. But they found the negative numbers help better, make this clearer, and 
help a lot of processing you want to do with the thing. So you don't see those very much. And as we go forward, you're probably going to see more and more floating point data like this because modern APIs tend to want them. Like uh, on Windows, when you use Wasapi, Wasapi, it um, wants floating point data given to it all the time and hardware starting to accept it more and stuff like that. But more importantly, as a software developer, much, much easier to do special effects on things in floating point, which if you were wondering why we did this the way we did, oops, where'd you go? There you go. Since this stuff is in floating point and we have a slider value that goes from zero to one, changing the volume is just a matter of multiplying it. One doesn't change it. Zero sets it to silence, because as you saw in Audacity there, before I just closed that, there you go, Audacity, there you go. Dead center of these dots, right there, zero. That's the silence value. And these are not, this little piece right here, it's not very far from silence, so you can hear it doesn't do very much. There's a little tiny click, but just a tiny one. Um, but, where'd you go? So, as we do this, if we move that slider all the way to zero, we're multiplying this by zero, and each of the samples goes to zero before we hand it to the audio device down here. So you can silence it out by multiplying by zero. We multiply it by one, and it won't change, or you multiply it by two, and it becomes twice as loud. It's such a simple, amazing little transformative property that makes it so easy to play with audio and do special effects to it and do stupid little things like our balance slider, which is called panning is a more accurate way to describe what we're doing there. Um, but that uh, is why we're doing this in floating point. Um, and as we want to add other effects or just be able to do things like doing a uh, visualizer and our equalizers and other DSP effects and, you know, visualization tricks and stuff like that. This makes it so easy to transform the data and do interesting things to it and have a wide range to do it in. Um, part of the reason, another good reason we're moving from this is 16-bit audio uh, tends to clip if you mix multiple sounds together, which say it hits the top of that 32,767 range and then there's nowhere for it to go. So you either overflow or you clamp or whatever, but that's called clipping. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, Ian DeFranco has a, album, a live album called Living in Clip because they were complaining, a technician was complaining at one point, they were playing too loud, and the amplifiers were all, as he put it, living in clip, man. So they, they needed to play a little quieter is what he was saying, or get better equipment. But Floating Point avoids a lot of that, gives you a nice large range of bits to do math on. So um, you can add sounds together. Um, for example, if you want to mix another sound into this, you just add the two values together. Multiplication changes the volume, but adding two uh, sounds together will make it, uh, we'll just put them, put both those sounds into the same stream. That's all you have to do to mix it is just add. Um, so if you want to uh, push uh, the left and right channel down into one, into a mono channel, you would just add them together and add, you know, maybe average them so it doesn't clip, but that's the basic idea of it. So um, easy, interesting. Uh, you can do a lot of cool things with it. But it occurred to me that we're writing uh, uh, an audio player here, and I did not explain how audio works on a computer. And if you've heard that before, then you know maybe that wasn't interesting. But if you're just wondering why, after all the stuff that I think I've explained fairly well, I didn't explain why this magic number, why this magic equation actually does the thing you want it to, and what exactly you're doing that math on, I just thought I'd take a moment to explain that. So that's... All I want to show you today. We're not doing any work on this today beyond those bugs we fixed, and I think we'll leave it there. Um, I think that's all you need to know for now, and uh, we're going to start doing more interesting th things to this next time. But I just thought you would, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone had a comfortable idea of what was actually going on once you get into this magic section down here. So, okay, cool. We are at 15 minutes, which is 10 minutes longer than I wanted to do this, but. Um, you know, if you're eating lunch during this, you can chew a little slower. You got time. We're done for the day. So, um, okay, great. I will see you next time. Take care.